I'm honored to introduce a, our closing keynote presentation featuring Maureen Mullen of L2. So super excited um, to be here today. And I, I have the enviable position of kind of going last. Uh, but um, for those of you that don't know L2, I'll give you a little bit of background on us. And then the talk today is going to be a little bit different than a lot of the stuff we typically do. Because we at L2 spend a ton of time looking at traditional manufacturers and retailers um, and looking at how they can really kind of make the jump into all of the areas that you guys have been talking about over the course of the past couple of days and kind of make the changes um, to their business models, make the changes to their organizations, to their teams, to their technology, um, to really kind of evolve to be viable competitors with kind of all of the threats in today's retail environment. Today we're going to flip that on its head a little bit and really talk about some of the innovators because I think when we talk to organizations time and time again, um, you know, we'll be talking to an iconic brand like Chanel, and they're trying to figure out how to organize for digital and omni-channel and e-commerce and retail. And they are not as interested in how Louis Vuitton or Caring Group or other competitors are organized, Cartier. They want to know how Warby Parker structures their team. Um, so what we're going to do today is look at some of the underpinnings of some of the retail innovators, what they do well, what they do not so well, and I think it'll be kind of a nice, uh, a nice way to sort of wrap up the day. Um, at L2, I briefly kind of introduced us. Uh, we're actually a business that came out of NYU. We benchmarked the digital performance of brands and retailers. We've benchmarked over 1,800 brands um, across about 10 different geographies. And we break down that into a balanced scorecard across the site and e-commerce experience, digital marketing, social media, and mobile. We'll go into organizations. Um, spend uh, half days with their team going point by point through where they're strong and where they're weak versus competition and help them understand in a platform agnostic way kind of where to make investments. Um, we also do a great deal of research which we'll be sharing today. So let's just talk about some of the themes and I'll go through this fast because you guys have been um, uh, listening to trends for the better part of the last two days. But we all talk about the growth of online, and, and that's obviously the, you know, when we look at the growth channel in retail today, it is online. We all know we need to be there. We know we need to be successful at it. We know we need to take on players that are exclusively online. And we know we need to do this because when you look at who the online-only shopper is, they're young and they're affluent. We have yet to meet a business that's like, we're just not interested in talking to young, affluent consumers. <laughs> Uh, it's absolutely kind of squarely within the demographic set that almost everyone's targeting. And then you look at kind of overall sort of where's the growth. And this is a scary slide because here we're looking at overall retail sales growth. You can see um, here kind of when you look at um, Amazon is now about 24% of all retail sales growth in the U.S. One player is 24% of all retail sales growth. You see the rest of e-commerce making up about 23%. And when we look at traditional brick and mortar, it's about 53%. So just over half of growth in this huge market in the US is coming from traditional kind of brick and mortar. Um, so overwhelmingly, and you look at kind of the, so you know, the other implication there that we don't often talk about is that Amazon is accounting for more than half of all e-commerce growth. So one player is accounting for more than half of all growth in the fastest growing channel. Think back to kind of the late 90s when Walmart was under considerable regulatory pressure for controlling 9% of all US retail. If you look at where Amazon is today, over um, November and December of this year, so the prime holiday shopping hours, Amazon controlled 43% of e-commerce sales. That is a scary, scary statistic when you have all, that, that kind of winner-takes-all environment in fast-growing channels. And this kind of underlies that. So here we're looking at the share of online sales of the top 50 U.S. e-commerce retailers. And, you know, 20 years ago, we all thought e-commerce, what a great business. We can, you know, sell our wares. We don't have to have the cost of capital of building stores. It totally sort of levels the playing field. It's actually happened that e-commerce favors players with scale even more so than traditional brick and mortar retail. And when you look at the top four players in the US control more than 40% of all uh, e-commerce, 
The other interesting thing is, is this actually isn't all that great of a business for most peer plays. Most players that sell only online, with the exception of Amazon, the cost of capital to acquire customers, the cost of fulfillment on the back end, particularly with rising customer ex expectations, and ha really kind of thinking through the customer acquisition model has been incredibly challenging. And e-commerce peer plays, with the exception of Amazon, control just about 8% of the market. So the world is not over for great multi-channel retailers, and we'll talk about that. So the other interesting thing is when you look at all of the startups um, in this space, so you look at the Ubers, the curbsides, the Ebays, the Instacarts, all of these folks that are arguably, I would say, are the biggest competitors to Amazon in that last mile space, this is where they've kind of built their hubs. And I think the true t test for all of these guys, Uber's been able to do it, most of the rest have not, is whether or not they're able to scale um, uh, nationwide. And to date, their hubs, look a lot like retail growth hubs. So when we look at where retail is growing and we look at where startups and these last mile solutions are growing, they match almost one to one. Um, you also see, I think there's a huge uh, misnomer that traditional retail is dead. When you look at great markets, and there's so much research that's been done on A, B, and C malls and you know, where re retail is thri thriving here in Manhattan, in some cases, kind of retail couldn't be stronger. And you see Hudson Yards, Brookfield Place, the, the World Trade Center Mall, not to mention um, countless other retail space opening up and performing incredibly well. And then when you look at peer play, so this is looking at the fastest growing e-commerce uh, retailers among the top 500. So we all talk about, we all kind of think we see the, the growth here. So all of these players highlighted in, in blue are traditional sort of uh, peer play retailers. But then obviously they've been heavily subsidized by the venture capital community. Very, 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 very few of them can actually operate profitably. And so you have, on one hand, you have this behemoth Amazon, which we'll talk about a little bit in a second. And then on the other hand, you have retailers that don't necessarily need to make money because VCs are just kind of pumping out money. Everyone else in the middle is getting crushed around e-commerce. You see this in kind of traditional businesses. So this is looking uh, specifically at P&G's business um, in the um, shave care category. So you can see 70% market share. What's even more uh, kind of powerful for P&G, they controlled 88% of premium grooming. So P&G loves to be in a business like premium grooming. High margin, they have total scale around the business, and every year they can slowly kind of raise prices because there's nobody else in the market. Who comes in? Um, Dollar Shave Club, which has absolutely overnight kind of caught P&G flat-footed with a model that matches kind of the Fusion Pro Glide, uh, Gillette's, uh, one of Gillette's best-selling razors, but at a fraction of the price, so at about $6. And I think that's where you do see peer plays having an advantage when they enter an incredibly concentrated market where, frankly, kind of the traditional market leader has gotten a little bit lazy. And I think that the Gillette example is kind of the right one. So let's switch gears a little bit to Amazon. So. You know, the, the argument that everybody makes is, you know, Amazon's not making money. After their most recent earnings call, um, we all kind of, I think, took a step back there because they had one of, I would argue, for retail today, one of the scariest kind of earnings calls as a forward-looking indicator that we've seen. Um, but really what's powered their business historically hasn't necessarily been the retail side of the business. It's been Amazon Web Services. Um, and you look at the contribution um, of Amazon Web Services in terms of growth and also in terms of their operating income, it's been, it's been substantial. Now, they obviously have this killer app called Prime. Not going to spend a lot of time on that, but you can, I mean, when you look at kind of the self uh, reported usage of Amazon among Prime members, and I think this continues to grow, it just becomes incredibly powerful of a tool. But they have a huge challenge around the rising cost of shipping. So, this is looking specifically at their shipping expenses versus shipping fee revenues that they're generating from Prime as well as other shipping fees. And you can see if Amazon is not able to kind of get this in check, even Amazon won't necessarily be able to operate a profitable pure play retail model. Now what Amazon has going for it, which virtually every other retailer can't compete, 
is the fact that they've managed kind of quarterly net income until Q4 of 2015 effectively to zero. So while Walmart and Target and Macy's and Nordstrom, you know, deliver their results to the street, they're looking for that all um, important kind of earnings per share number. Amazon is looking for the vision of Jeff Bezos. Now what that's resulted in has been a turn on EBITDA about nine times that of traditional retail. So if that is kind of put another way, for every one project Macy's can fund, Amazon can fund nine and only one of them has to work out. They have such a ridiculously cheap cost of capital. This is what happens, so this is mapping kind of Amazon to Walmart from, um, uh, uh, this is specifically net income from 1997 to 2015. And we all saw when Amazon's market capitalization kind of passed that of Walmart. That's absolutely crazy. If you look at Walmart and the amount of money they're making, you look at the amount of money Amazon is making, they're not even on the same playing field. But when, Amazon, when Walmart announces that they're going to take down earnings per share to put all important capital into investing in technology initiatives, into fulfillment, into e-commerce, arguably what a company like Walmart should be doing to prepare themselves over the longer term, their stock plummets about $20 billion in a 24-hour period. So I think y y you see kind of a lot of the inequity that's occurring sort of right now within the retail space. So what we wanted to do is kind of go out and look at this. So you take Amazon out of the equation because we would argue, you know, Amazon is to retail kind of what Apple is to innovation. You can't try to replicate the Amazon model. It's a, I think they've become such a ridiculously large beast and have so much capital right now that it's going to be difficult to kind of compete. Um, but what we wanted to do was look at how leading omnichannel retailers, peer play retailers that have started kind of in the online only space, and then peer play retailers that have recently opened stores, how they compare across customer acquisition, consumer experience, the last mile, and then return on investment. To really look at, when you think about the retail model of the future, what does that look like? Um, so th this slide is impossible to read, but kind of gives you the sense of who we looked at. So in the peer play retailers, everyone from an ASOS to a Revolve Clothing to a Shoe Buy to a Gilt Group, some of these folks have slowly kind of evolved into um, more evolved peer play retailers. Um, in the evolved peer play space, it's a lot of those startups that have recently um, introduced brick and mortar concepts. So everyone from a Casper to a Harry's to a Rent the Runway to a Trunk Club and then really benchmarked them versus leading omni-channel players. So everyone from Bloomingdale's to Nordstrom to Sephora to The Gap. Um, and saw a lot of very interesting trends. So the first one is just around customer acquisition. So this is desktop search traffic as a percentage of paid search traffic, excuse me, as a percentage of overall search. And the first thing you'll see is when you look at how peer play retailers, so those folks that are online only, acquire customers, not surprisingly, that's a really good business for Google. So about 20% of their search traffic is paid versus if you look at their peers in the evolved space, they're able to reduce that paid search traffic down to about 13.7% of their search traffic. You still see the omni-channel players playing a pretty significant role, but peer play retailers have, have spent significantly more in the search space. You see that playing out in terms of the average number of paid keywords they're buying. So about seven times the number of paid keywords to compete, again, from a customer acquisition standpoint. And they're paying about three times the average price for the search traffic that they're generating. And that's largely because Google is one of the only games in town when you're trying to acquire customers purely online. You also see them cast a much wider net. So here, we're looking at kind of where um, organizations like ASOS, Etsy, Overstock, and Zulily, they're playing on those very expensive, very generic terms, trying to use Google almost like traditional retailers use Fifth Avenue to drive some of that consideration by bidding on terms like maternity clothes, lingerie, jewelry, wedding dresses. Anyone who's played um, in the paid search game knows how expensive kind of those terms are. Versus if you look at where folks start to play as they open stores, they start to get much more narrow around sort of the focus of their products. So here we're looking at Proper Cloth, Casper, Harry's, and Birchbox, all who have recently introduced a brick and mortar presence. 
you can see much more focused around those core terms. And when you look at kind of the price they're paying for those terms higher, but the quality of their search traffic is also much higher. And ultimately kind of scale wins. Um, and, and this is just looking you know, specifically at how the, the search volumes compare to that of the JCPenney's, the Walmarts, and the Targets. And these guys still just have, you know, they're going head to head with Amazon, trying to kind of battle it out on, um, on the Google playing ground. And particularly with the advent of PLAs, which Amazon does not play in, have you seen their search traffic also explode? This was a very interesting um, piece that we saw. So we plotted um, of, uh, of the first, um, of the 16 uh, peer play retailers that opened stores, looked at the impact that that store opening had on organic search traffic to their website. And ultimately, stores are a fantastic marketing expense because you can see the orange dot here is looking specifically at the first store opening of Trunk Club, um, here of Rent the Runway, Warby Parker, and Proper Cloth. And immediately after opening that first store, in almost every case, you see that search traffic start to spike, and that spike is sustained. And what's interesting is when you peel that back to see where that search traffic is coming from, overwhelmingly, you see it disproportionately weighted to the geography where that store was open. So opening a store in New York has great benefit in terms of reaching um, New York consumers, not only in brick and mortar, but also online. You also see increased brand awareness. So on the x-axis here, you see the number of stores. On the y-axis, you see the monthly keyword searches for that brand name. And as, again, you open stores, th this makes sense. You have much more brand awareness, and you're getting that, freer, that, that much cheaper cost of traffic. The new pitch to venture capitalists, so it used to be in the late 90s, um, a company would go to the VC community and say, we are going to enter a category at a much lower cost of capital because we don't need to build stores. The new pitch in retail concepts is we are going to open an online peer play model. We're going to show proof of concept. And then we're going to take your capital. And as quickly as possible, we're going to scale out our store footprint. And you see that kind of playing out. So when you look at a lot of the companies that have just been absolutely um, highlighted kind of in retail, the Warby Parkers, the Bonobos, the Yojibos, Frank and Oak, all have been in the first kind of three years of launching have started to significantly scale that retail footprint. And I think getting all of the operational um, pieces in place and understanding kind of how to deliver product at scale in both an online and a brick and mortar environment is becoming increasingly powerful. This is looking at annual uh, store sales per square foot. So Warby Parker in New York is more productive than any other retailer with the exception of Apple's Fifth Avenue store. So that, that's just crazy. You have an online only player that sells eyeglasses at a, at a, at a price of $99 doing about $3,000 per square foot, more than Tiffany, Best Buy, Ralph Lauren, and Toomey. Um, so I think, again, you can see these concepts being, becoming incredibly successful. And I think what, what a lot of these startups are recognizing is that stores aren't actually an expense. Stores are the path to profitability. And I think we see with Bonobos, we see with, uh, with Warby Parker, we see with a lot of these, these uh, retail concepts that, th that um, these concepts have been in incredibly successful. Um, here's the example with Bonobos. So their guide shops, which they've, um, which they've launched kind of over the course of the last couple years uh, since the investment that was made by Nordstrom, you can see they have an 80% uh, conversion rate, almost double the average order value of what they're seeing in an online um, in an online environment, and also seeing a much higher proportion of new customer acquisition. All of that is great, but I think what's been most powerful for Bonobos is the reduction in their overall marketing expense. They've been able to cut that marketing spend down from 25% to just under 4% of sales, to, so to begin to deliver for the first time on margins that are somewhat sustainable. What we did here was, was uh, chart the path of sales and venture capital funding for two somewhat similar, uh, somewhat similar pos positioned retailers. So here, first you have ModCloth. This is looking uh, specifically at their sales. So you can see nice kind of healthy startup ticking up from about uh, just under 
uh, 5 million in, in 2008. As you get into 2010, 2011, ticking up over 80. And then by 2012, at about 144 million in sales. And here you can see Birchbox. Um, so this is looking specifically at Birchbox's, um, Birchbox's sales. This is what happened um, from, uh, th excuse me, that, that was looking at their funding. This is what happened to their sales. So Birchbox was able to accelerate significantly faster by opening stores. So it took them four years to get to 100 million in revenue on just 12 million in VC funding versus, uh, versus ModCloth, which was at about 64 million in VC funding, funding to reach the same threshold. Not surprisingly, um, if you look at, uh, you know, the, if you chart the path here, you can see uh, when they opened those stores. And I think we got a little messed up here. Um, <laughs> uh, now, I think the interesting thing is ModCloth now is entering the stores business and using that uh, to shape their strategy in a major way. Um, but let's look at the fulfillment space. That's an area I think that's just frightening to every retailer competing head to head with the experience in Amazon. Again, you see a distinct difference in terms of the free shipping threshold for pure play retailers who have taken that threshold down and able to deliver on that customer experience versus evolved pure play retailers who have been able to sustain higher kind of uh, thresholds for free shipping. Then obviously you have huge pressure from the, the scaled folks, Nordstrom, Target, Amazon, um, all uh, very low shipping thresholds. Uh, the other interesting thing is pure plays have definitely prioritized speed. So when you look at kind of where they've invested, 87% of pure play retailers offer two-day shipping, 65% next day, 9% same day. Now this is almost in direct conflict with what the customer says that they want. The customer would rather free versus fast, but they've invested significantly in a lot of these fast kind of shipping models because they don't have the ability for consumers to go kind of pick up those products. Um, and then we look at just some of the shopping subscription programs here. You, we all know Amazon and kind of what they've been able to do, but also see Walmart and then Rue La La beginning to kind of enter this shopping subscription. The interesting thing when we talk about kind of silos in organizations, and I think in traditional retail, the biggest challenge organizations have had is breaking down silos. How do you have the incentive structures in place? How do you have the technology systems in place so that teams are working well together? It's not e-commerce versus store, it's e-commerce and store. And that's been the whole omni-channel phenomenon. The interesting thing is we see in evolved peer plays, the same silos exist. So Warby Parker might not actually be the optimal organizational structure because in order to quickly get stores into the marketplace, what they've done is get a SWAT team in place Get that, who has that retail store experience. And oftentimes those technologies, those systems, and those incentives don't work any better than traditional retail. And you can see that playing out. Only 32% of evolved peer plays uh, that have opened stores actually allow you to return product you've bought online in those physical store environments. So a very basic sort of omni-channel capability. Now, we all know kind of omni-channel makes sense. I think this lays it out really well from a financial perspective. So if you look at a pure play e-commerce model, let's take a Bonobos as an example, because I think apparel's a good category here. If, if a guy goes online, purchases kind of pants um, on Bonobos, they have about a 23% return rate because the pants might not fit, you might not like the color, what have you. So Bonobos would capture in a pure play e-commerce model about 77% of that net initial sale. When you introduce kind of return in store capabilities, that chance for an exchange goes up significantly. So the, the recapture kind of of revenue jumps to about 95%. When you couple that with a buy online pickup in store model, so the consumer is actually making that purchase online, going in store and potentially enhancing the size of their basket, that rate jumps to about 107% of that net sales number. So definitely see that growing significantly. And I think the big phenomenon over the course of the last um, couple years has been how do you leverage stores as flexible warehouses? And Macy's has been a real example of this. They now do ship from store at 886 
of their U.S. locations. Now, I think they still have some kinks to work out around the ship from store program. But if you think about kind of why this is, this is effective, particularly for a retailer like Macy's, it allows them to seamlessly shift inventory around to be able to reduce the clearancing on items. Now, you have to think through the implications of this, and I think that the hub and spoke model tends to work well because you still see crazy things. I don't know if anybody shops on Macy's.com where you'll get, you know, you'll order three things. One will come from Alabama, another will come from Oregon, and then you have something coming from Vermont, which when you look at the cost of shipping, that's obviously not sustainable. Um, looking at Best Buy, who introduced Shep from Store in holiday of 2013, um, when they, they introduced uh, the program initially in June, um, by October they were actually able to reduce their shipment times down below that of Amazon. So there definitely can be uh, real efficiencies within this model. The other thing I think to keep in mind around Omnichannel is that this really isn't an investment for the short term, it's an investment for the long term. So this is looking at the stock performance of two fairly similarly positioned retailers. So Abercrombie and & Fitch and American Eagle, both playing in kind of the very troubled teen retail space. Teens no longer want branded hoodies, they want an iPhone and they want their Starbucks. Um, and I think you see that kind of playing out uh, in this space. But you can see their stocks have actually taken a very different path. Um, American Eagle, you know, recently through a mix of a lot of things. So it's not just great omnichannel, but I think what they've been able to do on the product side from an assortment perspective, reducing promotionality. But if you look at the investment threshold around their business, as their business started to decline from a stock price perspective, they ramped up investment in a lot of these initiatives. They, op they hired a chief digital officer, opened a technology center in San Francisco. They introduced ship from store at 255 locations, opened a new state-of-the-art fulfillment center in Philadelphia. Um, by uh, kind of mid-2015, through a lot of the personalization initiatives, were able to reduce the overall promotionality of their business. And then as of kind of uh, end of year, they introduced similar to kind of a Macy's or a Target who are no longer separating out e-commerce reporting, um, that, that, uh, that they were going to kind of keep those two numbers aggregated to really, in, uh, to really um, tackle kind of omnichannel from a financial perspective. Then you look at Abercrombie. Abercrombie was one of the strongest brands kind of back, kind of coming out of the recession. They thought nothing could hurt that business. And as a result, they kind of kept e-commerce siloed from the organization. They didn't think even social media wasn't all that important. And if you look, you know, in their December earnings call, they announced that their e-commerce business was up just 2%, and that includes online orders in stores. When your target demographic is 15 to 24-year-olds and your e-commerce business is up just 2%, that's a very bad forward-looking indicator. And Amazon is and um, Abercrombie is obviously getting hammered there. And you can see just some of the things that American Eagle has done from a more tactical perspective push notifications, the ability to reserve items in store through the app and then try them on, personalized offers, as well as a very integrated loyalty program. And they were able to return to positive sales growth about halfway through this past year. Next generation service. I think we're all kind of waiting for what does that next evolution of the store look like? Not surprisingly, when you look at some of these evolved startups, they are really focusing on the service environment in store using online as the path to get the consumer in store through services and also the option to book appointments. Um, here you can see with Indochino, um, a very interesting um, model where they'll allow you to make appointments kind of with their style guru, um, actually customize um, clothing and find the perfect fit. And they've seen kind of awareness um, grow significantly as they've introduced the service piece. Um, also, Rent the Runway. You know, Rent the Runway has always been service focused. They mail women two sizes of dresses, recognizing that only one will fit. But what they've recognized is that if they, they can get a consumer into one of their showrooms, have a stylist let them try things on and walk out with a dress that day, that they see higher transaction value um, and also have been able to significantly increase the loyalty of that customer. Uh, Trunk Club, another, I think, very uh, interesting retail concept that's all tailored towards men. So bars, coffee sh shops, 
um, in uh, all of their trunk club location, a lot of on-site tailoring stylists, um, and even in the Chicago location, a kind of a 5,000 square foot roof deck. Um, and I think when you start to look at how these new retail um, organizations are catering to particularly very niche customers, it's been quite interesting. Um, Casper is one of our favorites. Uh, so Casper sells $899 mattresses. They believe that the same mattress works for everyone. And how they've really introduced Omnichannel has been through showrooms and nap rooms, um, a series of services that they've introduced through both pop-up concepts as well as more permanent apartment-style snooze bars um, where they invite consumers to kind of take a nap with them, and then they can come home with a, with a mattress. Final point here today, I mean, I think it's really interesting to look at what's happened from an organizational standpoint. And you have a whole host of traditional retailers um, that, are, that are hiring folks from a lot of the, uh, uh, a whole host of disruptors that are hiring folks from traditional retailers. So not surprisingly, we looked at those Warby Parker numbers earlier. This is kind of looking at non-entry level team that's hired from particular organizations. 9% of Warby Parker's team actually comes from Apple. And you can see the consistency if you've been in a Warby Parker store of those two uh, retail environments. Um, Bonobos has hired about 8% of their team from J. Crew. When you look at Indochino, 8% from Club Monaco. Rent the Runway has hired from Bloomingdale's Guilt, Nordstrom, Macy's, and Trunk Club from Nordstrom, Groupon, and Macy's. So you see the whole host of traditional retailers kind of going into some of these startup businesses. So some of the conclusions. Um, we believe that e-commerce, and particularly peer play e-commerce, and if I didn't drive that home with the scary Amazon stats, I don't know what will, um, is a winner-takes-all business. And that it's going to become increasingly difficult to compete in e-commerce without a great omni-channel experience. And I think this is kind of, I think the, the model that we've seen permeate kind of the early days of e-commerce in the, the last kind of 25 years, where you have all of these entrants that are entering kind of with that peer play, we think that's slowly going to die. The myth of organic reach, as difficult as it is to get foot traffic into your stores, it is, Google is a much, much, much more difficult sort of real estate proposition. And I think to generate organic reach uh, to websites has become more and more and more of a challenge. And I think really the, the physical retail store is, is necessary there. Um, we're going to, you know, we, we all are kind of waiting for the day that, you know, the, the VC subsidies end. Um, and I think to a certain extent, the biggest disservice that Amazon has done the entire retail um, industry isn't actually that, you know, they've come in and they've just grown exponentially. It's that they've actually sort of introduced this model, which is just not sustainable over the longer term. Um, and I think at some point, you know, you have to, you know, the, the, the types of funding that they've secured and the, the, the expectations that they've created for other organizations that are entering retail are just not sustainable. Um, and we're, you know, at L2, despite the fact that we spend all of our time focused on digital um, investments and in, in how organizations optimize, I think we are absolutely huge believers that stores are the new black. That if you don't have great store experiences that are fantastic sort of marketing investments uh, for your organization and linking that with a fantastic online experience, you're virtually going to become um, irrelevant kind of from a consumer perspective. So with that, um, I will uh, wrap up. Thank you guys so much for your time.